Uh, welcome to the session on uh, Head Start on Cloud Native Event Driven Applications. So I am Suho. My full name is quite large. Uh, my name is Suho, and I'm from Sri Lanka. If you have never seen Sri Lanka, some of the pictures. Uh, and I am, I am the lead developer of this project called Siddhi, so I'm going to sp speak about that uh, mainly. And I'm senior director in a company called WSO2, which is named as the number one open source company in terms of integration. Right? Uh, and I'm also a part-time lecturer in two universities teaching big data and stuff. So if you take the current um, trend of the market, like what's basically happening, we in all in 1970s we had one big monolithic application, and over time that application has been divided into pieces. Now you have enterprise applications, and then you have SaaS applications, then you have APIs and things like that, and at the end now we have microservices. Why we have microservices? Simply because that gives us the capability of dividing the full platform into small pieces, and we can scale individual pieces independently. So that's a great power. But it does not only give, you, give us that. It gives you various other functionalities as well. Like, for example, earlier, you have this huge big stack. And like, for example, you might have an enterprise integrator in the middle or something in the middle. So there is always this thing called central of excellence. So there will be an integration team or a data team. If you are a developer, now you will develop some application and you will ask for, OK, I want to connect this to that. And that team will say, OK, we are busy. Wait for some time. And you will wait. Like, so it's, it's, it's a big process. right? So these microservices, what they basically allow you to do is like to take two pizza-sized teams. You, they give all the resources that you want. You deploy, you manage, you do everything that you want. Right? So that's the philosophy of microservices. And that is the main reason microservices is booming not like not because it's small. It's not the, it's not the main reason. It gives that, that autonomy that it gives is very very important. So in that angle, when it comes to cloud service applications, what you basically do, you create containers. On, on, on you put your application into containers and you build the CI/CD flow. So you really don't need to worry about you know asking different people for help. Uh, that CI/CD flow will deploy them, deploy your microservices into the cloud, and then you also have an agile DevOps process. So there is no different teams like now. There is a DevOps team and there is a developer team. Like everything is kind of getting merged to one another. Right? So the key aspect of this is like since we are creating several small applications, we don't need to develop everything in Java or everything in Go. Right? Earlier, it's not the case. Like you develop some piece of component, you have to put it into something else that is going to run that. Now it's not like that. It's like simple pieces. You, the team can decide what the language they want to use. They just put everything together and run it. So in such an environment, there can be scenarios where you want to write real-time applications, real-time specifically event-based and streaming applications. So streaming application basically means like human or machine generate some events. You just consume them, and you process them, and you alert them, or take decisions all in real time. Like, so the simple semantics is like queues and topics. You may use them within, within in memory, or within your program, or within in, in, in two different applications, whatever. There are producers, there are some sort of event integrator, and even consumers, they consume these messages and process them. So in such scenarios, it is quite easy to process stateless applications. If it is stateless, you know, if it is coming through HTTP, you basically have some services, you scale them and run it, pretty straightforward. If you have Lambda, uh, even if you have serverless, it works perfectly fine. So there is nothing to argue about it. It's highly scalable. Every developer loves to do things like that. But in the reality, world is not the same, right? So there are a lot of stateful systems, which, is, which makes our life very complex, right? So how people try to solve this complex problem of these stateful applications? Before going into that, let's look at some of the event-driven cases where you have this stateful thing. Like, for example, you are analyzing a system. You are, the server is producing some errors. You, over the last 20 minutes, you want to count how many times this system is making some error, right? So you just want to count for last 20 minutes. So you have to remember that last 20 minutes data, right? So you can't store each record into a database and run a query. It's going to be so slow, 
right? Or else, like for example, if you are you are a bank, you want to find transactions. Like for example, you are using a card in in Russia, and then within an hour, that card is being used in US, right? So is it like can you travel to Russia to US in one hour and use the card? Probably not, right? So it may be a fraud. Some somebody is hacking your card. So so you have to probably identify that immediately and notify the customer or do something about it, right? And then uh, you're buying patterns. Like for example, you may go and buy a, a diamond ring. Oh, that's okay, you're going to propose to someone, you go and buy a diamond ring, that's perfectly fine. But there is hardly a chance you guys buy three diamond ring, right? So it's not really a normal case. So if certain abnormal thing happen over a period of time, those are things that you basically need to remember and process. So for example, there can be, these are like occurrences, like A happened after that, B happened after that, C happened, I want an alert, those kind of scenarios. But there can be other scenarios, like uh, we delivered the item, the payment supposed to come within 15 minutes, it didn't come, so I want an alert. So it is a non-occurrence of event. This should happen, oh, it's not happening. Why? We want to get an alert and we want to look into that in detail. And even like uh, stock trade, like you want your prices continuously yeah, going up, 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 I'm happy. Whenever first, the first time it goes down, I need to get a notification so I, either I can sell or I can automate that thing. You can decide what you want to do, right? So these are some applications that basically uh, need memory and you have to remember previous events so and you also need to take decisions very very fast right so so the current solutions that we have is okay the main things that you have to focus is if the system goes down come back your state should be preserved if you are scaling in some way that state sh the state also should be shared right so some somehow you have to share that so the traditional options are like we have databases, we have distributed cache, or we have in-memory. So these are some options that we have. And different of these combinations work for different use cases. Like for example, database is not the best for performance, right? You every time when you write and read, it's damn slow. So don't really try to do databases. But like if your application is scaling, it's okay. You can manage the scalability and fault tolerance part of it because you have transactions, fault tolerance would be good. But whereas, when you have cache, cache is good, like if you have just two nodes, you want to do some reading stuff, you are going to write, just write some key map data into it and read it, it's okay. But like when, when, when your nodes become like um, eight and 10 and 20, the, the distributed cache come, becomes more and more complex and you can't do real-time decision making on that. And um, it is fault tolerant, but there are some, uh, some limitations here and there when it comes to scalability and performance. Whereas when it comes to in-memory, yeah, it's high performance, it's very fast because you're keeping everything in memory, it's super duper cool, but it doesn't scale or there is no fault tolerance about it. So in this scenario, there is like no tool that gives you all these three, three things together, right? So unless, otherwise it's a Swiss knife, you have lots of combinations, right? So we want to build a tool like that, like because you have to, we, we have options, we put everything together and we'll try to build a tool for our real-time system, like something like this, like you try to keep everything in memory, right? Um, and we don't want to store all the data always to the database, but we periodically store them, right? So if, if things goes down, we can still recover from somewhere, right? And then even whenever possible, we try to cache stuff, right? So you can cache certain information, so it will be a little more faster. So if you are a developer and if you want to do something like this, this is something you might do, right? In your application, if you are writing in Java, Go, whatever thing, you have to implement all this piece of code. And what if, if you are going to scale that, right? So the scaling, this is kind of already sold in Flink and Storm and all the other big technologies. Like you try and tend to follow this particular promotion of MapReduce. Like the, the data co will come in, you have some stateless services, they will identify a thing called a partitioning key, right? So they'll partition your data by key and then it goes to a message broker and within the message broker, you can basically find out, okay, uh, for if I imagine that you have stock prices coming in, for each stock company, you want to do some aggregation, right? So stock company name will be the partitioning key, and for each company, there will be a stateful service running that processing that stuff only, right? So then that way you can have an easy way of scaling. And all the data, all the processing that you are doing is f in that node itself, so there is no internode communication, so your performance is very fast, and there is no issue at all. 
But what happens if your node goes down, right? You are going to lose events. You are going to lose some stuff. So that's going to be a problem. So in those cases, what you basically do is you do per, um, periodic snapshots, right? So you're going to periodically snapshot that. OK, my system went down. So what am I going to do now? You restart that system, or there's a new one spawned by Kubernetes or whatever the engine that you're using, and you load that back, right? So you have loaded the last snapshot that you have sold, stored. That basically means sometimes you are uh, snapshotting every five minutes. OK, after the last snapshot, you were processing up to two minutes, and then your system died. So there's this two minutes data that is missing from this, right? So how you can get that stuff? You can, in nowadays, you can basically re-ask those data from the source. Like, for example, if you have Kafka or things like Nets, they remember the messages. Like, when you read the messages, they don't just drop them. So they still remember all of those stuff. So you can basically read them back and start doing the processing, right? So that is that capability is there. So we can basically use that. So if you fetch the data back, and now you are in a steady state again, and you start continuously processing. So that's 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 a viable solution. So if you want to build something really, really fast with performance, this is an approach that you can do and build your solution with. And if you are a traditional programmer, or if you have a, if you have something, how are you going to do this stuff? Like it's a lot of engineering problems. Like how it's 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 nothing that a normal person would like to solve, right? So this is just in underneath stuff. We have business problem to solve. We are not going to solve this engineering problem, right? So that's why we have these cool systems like Flink, Spark, Storm, and all of these stuff. They basically try to solve this problem at scale, right? So they have already invented and solved these kind of problems, and. You have messaging layers that basically help you out. Uh, and then you have processing layers, which basically process this stuff. But when you take the traditional environment, there are some limitations. Like, for example, they are usually massive. Like, they need to, you need to have six to eight nodes. And you have to have some specialized knowledge on how do you run them and how do you manage those stuff. And then there is also a thing comes like, for example, if you have one system for the whole organization, then that, 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 that will be, go to that particular team. Right? So if you are in a different team, then there are like pol internal politics of how whether you get that, they give data, like when you connect them, all of those delays. Right? So this is the anti anti uh, microservices stuff, right? So which basically reduce your productivity. And um, we can also, this can also reduce the uh, autonomy of the team, right? So uh, in this particular scenario, what we have, we are trying to do is to make, to rethink this real-time application development or real-time processing stuff natively in Kubernetes or natively in the cloud, right? So if we try to move the traditional big data solutions as it is to the cloud, like there are some limitations. Like we can, in the, in the earlier presentations, we might have seen like when you try to run several stuff on Kubernetes, it doesn't work and there are a lot of issues as well. Right, so we are working on this project called Siddhi, like it is a cloud native, it's a, it's a sim small library as, as initiated. Uh, and it has it's lightweight, it has low, low memory footprint, it is 100% open source Apache licensed, so there is no commercial features, like there is not, nothing, nothing like hidden, like you, there is a commercial feature, you have to get support, or this is like non-commercial, there's, there's no two layers to it, everything is free and open source. And it has native support for Docker and Kubernetes, and it has an agile CI/CD pipeline, and you can program it in SQL-like language. And for little non-technical people, we also have a uh, graphical drag-and-drop editor implemented on top of this SQL analogy. So people who are using this, like for example, Uber is using this, eBay, PayPal. So in the Uber case, they use this system to do uh, uh, specifically uh, frauds in terms of taxis. Like for example, uh, you have given, in the Uber case, they, they give options like uh, if you, if, as a driver, if you make 10 rides a day, uh, you might get some offer, right? So now you have, as a driver, you have done eight rides. Okay, you are feeling, uh, we, are, we want to go home, I, I, you don't like to do true drives, so what you do is like, when the customer comes, you discuss with the customer and, and break that 
last ride into two rides, right? So you drop it and then you pick up again. So they want to identify some scenarios like that and and immediately notify the custom, notify the drivers. Okay, this uh, ride is immediately being started, so you are not counting this for your offer, right? So it's automatically cancelled, right? So those scenarios are like real-time fraud detection scenarios are being implemented here in in Sydney uh, by Uber. And then in eBay and PayPal, so they are using uh, this one for uh, as a policy enforcement engine. For in, in, in real time, you detect certain uh, policy rules, and we they try to um, detect them. And in BNY Mellon, they it's a, it's a bank in uh, America, so they basically use it for notifications of uh, transactions and activities. And in terms of transport of London, they are using this for some traffic monitoring management stuff. And in WSO2, uh, there are two other products called API Manager and Identity Server. In the API Manager, this is being used as the throttling engine. Like you have to, uh, in the API is how many users you can, how many messages you can uh, publish as a user. If you are publishing more, you are immediately throttled and rate limited. All of those things are done by this system. And in, in terms of the identity framework, if you are logging in from a different country, like you logged in from Russia and now you go, go to Africa to a different country and now you are trying to log in. So it identifies the pattern of your uh, stuff and it asks you to two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication, or it asks you some various different questions uh, and all of those stuff. So those are enforced through this particular library. So I'll try to go and explain explain how this library can be integrated into your systems. Like, for example, it, it, this library was originated as a Java library long time back. So you can embed that into any application that you want and build that one. So some of our customers took that Java library and they started implementing microservices by themselves. right? And they found some problems and they were trying to solve the problems by themselves. So what we try to do is, OK, you are solving that problem. Everybody has that problem while we Oh, everyone get together and solve that problem in terms of Kubernetes and microservices world. So that's how this project was initiated, and now we have a, a way of uh, doing micro, like you, you have a Java and Python based library, you can embed into your program, or else you can download it and run it as a, in a VM as a small server, it works, or else you can also get as a Docker container or a Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes artifact. All of these are possible. So you develop that in an editor, you export those artifacts, you run, go through the CICD pipeline, and then you can basically deploy them. So I'm happy to announce the 5.1 version of Siddhi, which had like uh, native support for exporting a Docker and Kubernetes artifact out of you, uh, after you develop that. And we, we have added gRPC and Protobuf uh, S3 and Google Cloud Storage support for this. Uh, and we have enabled database caching as a first level feature uh, and support for complex transformation using list and maps and all various other stuff and improve the error handling when there are system downtime. So I'll, I'll try to explain them later in more detail. So uh, this is an SQL-like language. So I'll try to show you some SQL-like code. Uh, if you can't understand it, uh, please bear with me. So SQ, in, in terms of um, streaming, we, we, you, you, a stream can be uh, envisioned as an infinite length of table. Right? So there's a table, there's a lot of rows, there's, it's infinite length of rows because it's con con data is continuously coming in. So we define stream also something like a table, like define stream, temperature stream, and uh, we have room number and temperature. Well, that's, the, that's a stream. Right? And we can define a source. We can say add source and give Kafka and give the Kafka configuration. Like where you want to consume that message from. And what is the message type you are going to get? Whether it's JSON, XML, or, or Avro, you can give that as an annotation. After that, OK, now you have consumed from Kafka. So you are going to run an average over time, right? So what we are basically doing is, like, from the temperature stream, I have a window of five minutes. Like, if you're going to calculate average, you can't calculate average for the infinite length, right? So you have to have a boundary. So in that boundary is last five minutes in this case, and you basically calculate average, grouping that by a room number and re producing a new stream called average temperature stream. So that average temperature stream will now have room number and average temperature. You can do further processing on that stream and, and you know, keep on chaining that and do something, whatever you want, right? So 
This is the querying language. There's a graphical editor that you can type the queries and simulate some message uh, and stuff. So this is a web-based editor. And there is also a dra graphical drag and drop part of it that you can uh, build this stuff. So when it comes to the CI CD flow, so you will write, now it's, it's a script, right? So it's not a Java program or anything like that. It's just a simple script. So you write the script, you push it to the GitHub repository, and we have implemented a way of do, doing unit test on that. So the, the system will run unit test on your queries. You know, you can test each query without connecting to Kafka or, or any database. You can just remove all of those external connections. You can just test that code itself as a unit test. If that test is successful, then you start the full container and the full flow in Docker, right? So in the Docker case, uh, a Kafka will be started as a Docker, you will start um, your application as a Docker, a MySQL server as a Docker, and it will test each other, right? So that will basically make sure your system is running as expected. And then uh, in the cloud scenario, you can use Splinter or something and basically deploy it to your system. And the same test that you have written for the integration, you can now point to uh, a cloud runtime and run it as a black box test. So the system is already developed and deployed in, 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 in a cloud on a Kubernetes environment. You can run all your tests. You can validate all of them are working. So you can go to production. So there is no hiccup on going to the production. So you, you, whatever that your change that you have done, it goes through a unit test, an integration test, a black box test, and go to production. So hopefully there is no, uh, no errors. So if you want to implement such, uh, such an event-driven application, I'll try to go explain some of the patterns that you will encounter, like so some of the things that you will do, and how you can implement using this particular language. Like so, I'll not go into details of these right now. I'll take a simple scenario where you are going to order some items. The customer is going to place an order. The shipments will be made. And when the deliver delivery is done, you will pay the money, right? So that's the sequence of things happening. And you want to uh, f identify the order and send a fulfillment. You want to send an alert uh, when there are abnormal conditions are met. You can send recommendation based on the previous purchasing uh, patterns. And you want to throttle, you know, people are ordering continuously, but they're not paying. So you want to throttle that order, right? You know, you can't order anymore because you have uh, in enough money to be sent, given to me on that side, right? So, and you also want need to do a pro, um, order anal analysis over time. So let's say how we can consume events in various formats. Like for example, there are, there are options like Nats, Kafka, RabbitMQ. So all these, uh, whatever that I have listed here, there are pre-built connectors for that, right? So uh, Amazon SQS, e email, and you know, WebSocket. Uh, and you, you can also do CDC on the data because when you have legacy applications, you can't touch them, right? So only thing that you can do is you can watch the database. And if people are inserting into it or, or, or updating into it or deleting onto it, you basically capture that data and you stream that. So you can process that. So if you have legacy applications, the best way to capture data is through change data capture. And then you can also have file-based stuff. So there are connectors for all of these. So that is basically the data ingestion stuff. So in the microservices world, there are other systems. You basically get data from them. And the data can come from any format, like JSON, XML, Avro, Protobuf, whatever that you want. So there are, there are messaging formats that basically help you to do that as well. Like for example, in the JSON case, like when you just say JSON, it will, the system will assume, OK, you will be sending the message on that particular format that you have defined. Like, that's, that's a default format. Like, there's a custom ID, there's item, and the amount. So if you send the message on that particular order, you don't need to give any mapping. The system will consume it. But whereas sometimes your external system will not send it on that format, it will send it on a different format, in that case, you have to give some uh, X path expressions and say, uh, sorry, uh, JSON path expressions and say, OK, the first one, the ID is what is custom ID. It means ITM is the item, and the count is the amount. right? So you can basically map them so the system will understand. Like Similarly, for text, JSON, XML, Avro, and everything, there is a way that you can configure these kind of mappings. Right, so now you have consumed that data. 
After consuming, you have to do some pre-processing to it, right? For example, okay, if the item is unknown, I'm not going to process that, I'm going to drop that. So all the non-unknown items, I am going to process that. So if the custom ID is not given, so it is some internal purchase, so I want to put internal as my value. If the amount is less than zero, I want to reset to zero. So those are like, you have to do some uh, pre-processing, some trimming messages, like there will be messages coming on different formats, so you have to manage them so that the whole system will run correctly. So there can, you may write several rules like this. You can use regular expressions, default functions, null checks, and things like that. Basically do some filtering and pre-processing of that data. When you have that, the second thing you want to do is you want to transform that data into various forms. Sometimes you don't want to map, split the JSON at the initial stage, you still want to have the original JSON itself, but you, you want to dynamically retrieve different values out of that JSON. So there are functions, like you can pass your JSON and say and, and an expression, so it will give you that stuff out of it. Right, I want to give me the amount out of it as a double, so it will give you as a double. Or you can set into a JSON, you can concat and create a new string, you can do mathematical and logical expressions like uh, and or, um, multiplication, division, and stuff. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> um, uh, inbuilt uh, functions, there are like lots of functions that you can write into it. And in terms of databases, there are lots of databases that we can connect to. And in terms of the database, like if you didn't specify any annotation, it is the database that is in memory. Like in memory, you have you can have indexing primary keys, the data is kept in memory, but whenever you want, you can put add store annotation to it, then the data will be stored into that database. And then you can also say add cache and put ca caching configurations, so now the data is cached also, so it will be even more faster. Right, and then for example, sometimes you want to call out and take a decision, like so you can uh, call an external service, that service can return 200, 400, whatever that you want, you may not really know. So you want to process it accordingly. So you basically call, like you have a sync that is doing an HTTP call, it is calling uh, my, my store, it is giving us a re response, so we, we correlate that one with the response processing element with the same sync ID, and we capture that message and continue processing, right? So, so there will be some part of data that is captured from the message, right? And some part of data that is captured from the original event itself. Like we are not sending that data, but the da original data have, even have some data. We want to use that and continue. Right? Sometimes this things goes wrong, right? Uh, what if the endpoint is not available? What are you going to do about it, right? So are you going to log and drop the message? Or you want to infinitely wait and give back pressure? Sometimes people will ask, okay, why don't you uh, write that into a database and send that later? Like usually customers ask those kind of questions, right? So if you want to do that, there, is, there are simple ways to do that. Like for example, you can say, okay, I have this particular sync which is trying to call this logger service. I can put an on error stream, right? So that basically means if I can't publish to that, send it to a, uh, the error stream. So there's an error stream which is going to capture that and insert into a table, right? So it just captured and push it into a table. Uh, and you can do various type of summarization. I was explaining about some earlier, like time window, time based, time, uh, time based, event based, session based, and all call kind of uh, all kind of durations, like some uh, min, max, count, average kind of stuff, right? So this is a last 10 minutes sum, right? Uh, and then if you have even a longer period of uh, time, like you can even do second, minute, hour, year kind of aggregation, right? So, so people usually ask, you know, I want an yearly graph, I want to click that and drill down to monthly graph, click that and drill down to uh, various type of graph. Like in those cases, like when you pass a query, some data will come from database, some, some data will come from real time. Right, so you will get accurate numbers in real time. The system will use backend databases and memory to compute that whenever you want. And when th there will be always rules that you want to write, right? Sometimes it's a single simple rule. You, you, everything is there in the event. You do the filtering and send an alert. Or else you have a summarization stuff. You monitor last 10 minutes data. You take an average. And on that average, you want to apply some rules that is possible, or else there can be even like patterns that you detect. Like for example, this is the scenario I was talking about. There was an order happened for every order, followed by, this arrow is called followed by, 
followed by no payment for the same order for 15 minutes. I want an alert, right? So for every order E1, there is no payment for 15 minutes, so I want an alert. Right? So you can write similar complex queries. This is called the complex event processing and stuff. So these kind of stuff is very hard to develop in, uh, with uh, databases. You can't ever do that because these are state machine implementations, which is quite complex. And then you also have these machine learning models and stuff that you want to serve in real time. Like you might have built a PMML model or, or, or Java TensorFlow model, so you can put that into a real-time system and do predictions. And at the same time, we also have gone through several research papers and implemented some of the state-of-the-art uh, clustering, classification, and regression online learning algorithms. So they will be accurate to some level with the latest data, but uh, it might not work. It might sometimes, you can use a combination of uh, pre-trained model and online trained model and ensemble at the end to, some, to get some, some, bet, some better understanding of the current state. And there is also these kind of scenarios, like you get a list of items. Okay, you want to split them, you can tokenize it, you split them into small, small parts, you do some processing, then you, that processing changes that data, and then you want to again group them and send it out, right? So those are some simple use cases that you might need to, want, you might need to implement. And there, there will be cases where you want to integrate these applications, like you want to uh, modularize the whole script into several pieces and connect them and implement that. Like for example, if you are a telecommunication company and you are providing offers, each of these will be an offer. Each of the app will be an offer, right? So if you are giving that offer, you put that app. If you are not, doing, not sending the offer, you would simply remove that, right? So that will basically help you to uh, connect and process these applications. And there are also, sometimes the events are not coming from outside. You have to generate the events so you can have triggers like that sends every, every five minutes, every Monday to Friday at 10 a.m., 10, 10, 15 a.m. Or I want to just, when we start the system, I want to send a, send a trigger to initialize certain stuff. So there are some other scenarios. And in terms of the, when the real-time application is running, sometimes, or some other applications, or even human, might want to interact with this and see, okay, what are the, what are the items that is delivered and not been paid? Like there will be some in-memory information that you want to expose to external parties so they can make informed decisions about it. So there is an API so you can uh, understand what the data is, what data is in in-memory table, what data is in the, in the windows, so you can take some decisions about it. Or else even sometimes uh, the system can send a request to the system, it will, synchronously send you a response. So you can ask something and wait till you get a response, right? So should I allow this, uh, custom, should I allow this um, uh, user to log in? You wait till the system set a response, you say yes or no, and then you can continue that. Right? So those kind of questions can also be asked on this particular framework. So let's see how you, how you basically develop this application and kind of run that in Kubernetes. So I'll, I also had a video, but I'll try to, uh, show it to you um, on, through a demo. So this is the tool. I'm just starting that. So it's not really complicated. It's uh, right. So this tool is started. So it has some examples, and you can go to new. You can write your application. So I'm not going to write the applications right now, uh, but rather I'll show you an application that I have already written. And like for example, if you have made some mistakes, so it it also like um, um, it, it, uh, it 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 basically gives you some uh, errors and informations as well which I'm not going to go into details right now. So there is a graphical mode that you can see you know, here. Uh, I'll try to delete this. Uh, go to source view, save it, and I'll go. To, I'll try to show how, you, how I added a sync to that, right? So I click for the sync. I drag and drop that part into it. Click configure, what type of sync you want. I'm not sure whether you can see this. Uh, there are some options, so I want to do an HTTP sync where you want to send this message, right? So I have copy-pasted, I'll copy-paste this. So I'm going to send it here, 
and what is the message format I want to send it. I'm going to send it through a JSON and I'm submitting that. Okay, I have added this particular part. So when I go to the source view, you will be able to see uh, a sync being added here, right? So I have added sync twice. So that's why it's happening. So let's add a log sync here, like add uh, sync and sync log. So I have, I have one sync which logs and the other sync which basically uh, send it to an HTTP URL, right? So it gives you auto completion and things like that as well. So the in in this particular case, the mess this is the curl command that we are going to send in. Like so, we have a users message. These are the user IDs, and the the and they are ordering from this from this uh, district. That's the information that is coming in, and you want to uh, calculate the demand. So you want to split. Uh, each of these and assign like 501 is uh, this district, 504 is this district. Likewise, you want to even do some message processing. So let's see how, how that is being done here. Right, so like for example, uh, this message consumed that data, the users are mapped to user IDs, the from is mapped to the location, and from that, what we are basically doing is we are tokenizing by the user ID comma, and I'm saying true, that basically means I want the unique user IDs, and then I am basically, basically putting the location. So now that concatenated message has become user ID and the location mapping. So the, after that, I have a 10 minute window. I'm doing a count, group by, if, if the uh, average is greater than five, I want to send an alert every 10 seconds. So I, want to, I don't want to continuously send. If the same thing happens again and again, I want to send every 10 seconds. So that's basically happening here, and this output will go to the logger. Right, so that's all about it. Let's try to run this application in the tool, right? And then you can even simulate the messages like just 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 going through these streams here. For simplicity purposes, I am I have the copy pasted code. We don't have enough time to run that, so I'll I'll run this curl command. Uh, and there's a logger service I want to start to capture the logs. So this is a simple service that is running on 8080, where, where it will uh, uh, so, so this connection refused because I have not started. Okay. Okay. So it goes there since I have sent six messages together. It it basically sends a response. Like when I send the second, third messages, you will see uh, it's been updated a little later because on. Um, <laughs> because of the use case, right? So, so that's a simple case. Let's see how we can deploy this in Kubernetes. I can say export to Kubernetes. I can want. I have this application I want to export to, and in this particular case, I'm using localhost. So, localhost will not work in my Docker for Mac uh, scenario. So, in that case, I want to ch template that. I'm templating to to this value. So, instead of localhost, I'm putting this one. Right, and there are some other configurations you want to add that. So the log, then it, it, it default, it gives you some defaults, so I don't want to use that. I want to give, uh, since I'm running on, on a Docker, uh, I, I want to have host Docker internal so that the, the service that I'm running in my machine will be, it will send the message back here. So these are some internals of Kubernetes. Don't really worry about it. If you have any extensions or other jars, you can select them here. I don't have anything, that's fine. I want to push to the registry. You can do that for the for, for the public or private Docker Hub. Uh, here, I need to give a name. So this is my uh, my Docker Hub name and my username, password, and my email. Right. So and it will ask, okay, whether you want to run it as a non-distributed application or whether you want to split this and run it as a distributed application with nets in between. right? If I, I say I want to do that, I'm not going to persist the state part here because there are some, uh, I have to add some additional configurations. Okay, this is downloaded and I'm saving that resource and you can see on the back end that's been pushed to the uh, um, uh, Kubernetes, like uh, Docker. So this is downloaded. So what I will do is I'll basically go here So this is the file downloaded. I extract that, 
and and then what I would need to do is I just need to apply Kubernetes. Oops, all right. So before I apply anything, I'll just try to show what are the pods that I have. So you will have an understanding of things like cube, CTL, get pods, right? So you will be able to see uh, there is some, I, I have Nets and Nets streaming operator, which is for my messaging purposes, and the Nets server is running here. And I also have a Siddhi operator, which understands Siddhi by default. It can do some processing in itself. And you can also say native, it's native because you can say at get Siddhi, right? And there's no resources on that. You have not, you have not published any application so far. So let me do this, put this application here. Oops. Okay, I have created this application. So now when I get Siddhi, it is status, it says it's not ready. Because when you go to pods and see, uh, you, you can see something called a parser started. So this parser will basically uh, understand your piece of code. It will try to divide the state part and the stateless part into two, and it will deploy them into two applications. So that's what is going to happen, right? So let's go to that. Uh, uh, so let's me, let me do a get city again. So now both are running, and you can see on the pods, you know, there is my zero and there is my one. Right, so if I send any message right now, this one, you will be able to see a resource. So that's all for the presentation. Give me some time. Okay, so if I, if I send a curl, oops. Okay, so you can see an output being printed. Uh, from from that so so this is all what I have you know how easy that you can download those stuff and run it on the cloud so what happens in the background is this right so uh, your application is divided into stateless part stateful pass it's there's a not stat cluster with two nodes will be added in between and there will be an ingress there will be a service created to you there's a deployment created to you and if when you configure it the persistent volume will be also created for the stateful service and the whole complex thing i was talking about you know you consume that periodically persisting that and all of this stuff is handled at this level so you really don't need to worry about any of those uh, mess so it will it will happen by then, and then you can simply say, you know, all both of them are running as 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 expected, and that's all we have. Okay, cool. So uh, this is my, the Siddhi.io, the project. It's a full open source project, and you can contact me on this. So hi, we are done. I think I'm running over time. <laughs> Any questions? Mm -hmm. Да, спасибо. Если у вас есть вопросы, можете задать их, подняв руку, дав вам микрофон, либо же зайти на слайды и написать свой вопрос, он высветится на экране, и спикер ответит. Секундочку, сейчас появится. I also have some stickers of this project, like if you like, you can just take it off. Okay, so Kafka have uh, Kafka and KSQL. This is an alternate, kind of an alternative, right? For example, if you want to go cloud native, we have uh, Nets. So Nets is a um, CNCF project, something like Kafka, which is so native to the cloud, you can run a lot of processing with just two nodes. So we are doing this in conjunction with them, right? So the Siddhi is an alternative to KSQL, but like you have KSQL, Kafka Connect, and multiple stuff, so you, here you don't need to have everything. You, you can do all of those stuff in Siddhi, and then you can also use Nets as the internal messaging system. So we are also improving the Kafka to, um, improving this on the next release probably to support Kafka also as an internal messaging system whenever, whenever that's there. And uh, how are you? Uh, why you are using custom SQL uh, uh, instead of ANSI? Yeah, that's like we w we are trying to do uh, uh, native stream processing. So within that case, like uh, the the SQL is written in a way that streams. You know, like there's there's input, you do some stuff, there's output that comes from this, and that also streams continuously, right? So. Uh, 
even though you say ANSI like you, you really don't find very complex learning this stuff. You have only about 12 constructs. You just need to remember that 12 constructs so you can put uh, reuse again and again and again and you can, you can build anything that you want. So this is not like, uh, there are two approaches. You can go like Chinese, like you have a um, few words, but it's complex language. You have to learn a lot of stuff. But this is not like that. This is like very simple. You have only a few constructs. You reuse that again and, and build the whole stuff. Uh, how Siddhi, um, uh, uh, it can of course handle 100k messages per second. This is with network, right? So if you have network, the recommended size is 100k events per second. But whereas uh, if, um, uh, if you are running it in memory, like embedding in your application, it can go up to 1 million events per second. So that's like really fast if you want to do in memory decision making. So that's what some of our customers like Experian, like they are using this for digital marketing scenarios. So they use in embedded cases. But when it comes to database transaction, like, OK, the data, my messages comes in, sometimes you want to read the database, right? Sometimes there is no option. You can't cache the data because your use case is like that. You have to read the database by yourself, right? So in that case, that will produce the latency. Like, so in, because of that, the performance can go down. It can't do 100 million events per second. Obviously, it will go to the maximum that the database can perform, right? So there are limitations like that. Uh, 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 and whether it can run on promise, of course, you have a VM version. You can just download it, put this in the app that you have created. You can export the file. You can configure it, and you can just run it. So this, we are, our main focus is the cloud, because the cloud is lacking uh, something like this, like a small, uh, a single team managed service that you can do real time streaming stuff. right? So we want to make that experience cloud native, but that doesn't mean that you can't do the same stuff in an in a on-premise system. Like, if you are not going to cloud, don't really worry about it. You can simply do it, you know. You just can unzip and start. It works on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Perfectly, That's, those are the stuff. Hopefully, I answered the questions. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Да, время подошло к концу. Если у аудитории есть еще какие-то вопросы к нашему спикеру, у нас есть уголок Асми Корнер. Он находится напротив первого зала до конца по коридору. Вот, можете подойти уже к спикеру и лично задать ему вопрос, который вас интересует по данной теме. Спасибо. Okay. Thank you.